there, I'm Brittany from Lo and Behold Stitchery, and today I'm here to share a tutorial for one of my bucket list quilts, the Cathedral Window. I was first inspired to make this quilt after seeing a sampler quilt that my grandmother made, and one of the blocks in that sampler quilt was a Cathedral Window quilt block, and this was my first time that I ever saw it, and I was so just in awe of this beautiful design and construction. And from that moment forward, I knew that I had to make one one day. Over the last few years, I have been testing and experimenting with different sizes and techniques until I have finally landed on what I'm about to show you. This video goes along with the free Scrappy Windows quilt pattern. It is a free download on our website. I will link to it below. So be sure to go and download the pattern so that you can follow along with the video. You can truly customize any part of this quilt. So we have the frames, the background portion, and the window portion of the pattern. Inside the pattern, there are fabric requirements for each of these groups. You can use fat quarters, pre-cuts, or scraps from leftover projects, hence the name. Within the pattern, you'll also find lots of different layout options. So you can create a traditional three color quilt or go with the scrappy instructions, which just means that anything goes. You can also create any sort of design or layout that you wish, or just use your scraps and create something that is totally unique to you and your stash. As I have been experimenting with this design and this construction, I have come across a few different shortcuts and just special tips that I think are going to make this process so much easier. You'll see that there is quite a bit of fabric in this quilt because of a special folding technique that we are going to be doing. And because of that, there are several different tips that I want to be sure to point out to you. I have tried out several different size squares for this pattern and I have landed on the three and a half inch square. It makes the perfect size window in my opinion, but that said, you are welcome to use any size square you wish. You will just cut all of your squares the same exact size. So again, refer to the pattern and pick out a size that you would like to make. There are five different sizes ranging from pillow all the way up to king size. I am going to be making the large throw size of the pattern in this tutorial. So go ahead and download the pattern and I'll meet you right back here and let's get started. I am making the large throw size of the pattern and I am wanting to do a sort of ombre scrappy look for this quilt. Now you might notice that I am using slightly more fabrics than what is required in the fabric requirements. And that's just because I want more variety within my quilt. So feel free to use the fabric requirements just as a jumping off point for your quilt. Whenever I am doing repetitive cuts like this, so I am cutting all three and a half inch squares, I like to stack several fabrics on top of each other and sort of batch cut those fabrics so that I'm cutting through multiple layers of fabric. You'll want to make sure that you have a nice sharp rotary blade for this process if you choose to double up like I am. But this just really speeds up the process and I find that it really doesn't take me that long to cut as many squares as I need. The cutting instructions portion of the pattern will tell you exactly how many squares you need. I am combining the background and window portion of my quilt, but the pattern is separated out so that you can know exactly how many squares you need for the frames, backgrounds, and window portions individually. Then for my frames, I am going to be cutting those squares from yardage. So I actually have a blog post called How to Cut from yardage. So if you are someone who needs a little bit of help with that, then be sure to check out that tutorial linked below. The cutting for this pattern is super straightforward. You are just cutting all three and a half inch squares. Moving on to the sewing instructions portion of the pattern. This is on the bottom of page four. Now it is time to fold all of our frame squares in half diagonally. You'll press a crease with your iron and then set those frame pieces aside for now. 
Then you'll want to decide on a layout for your quilt. So if you are doing a completely randomized layout or if you are making a three color quilt, then this step isn't really necessary. But since I am making an ombre quilt, I really wanted to plan where each square was going to go within my quilt before I got started. So again, this is more so important if you are someone who wants to plan exactly where each square is going. And the best way to do this is to lay out all of your background squares and figure out where those are going to go first. So I'm making the large throw. I have 20 squares across by 22 squares down. Then I'm going to plan exactly where my windows are going to go. Again, you can plan this part later if you like, but I am going to place all of my window squares at a diagonal in between each of my background squares just to get a feel for where they are going to go. This looks super busy and chaotic, but remember there will be frame pieces separating everything. Obviously, if you're making the pillow size or the baby size, this can be a little bit easier because you just have less to plan. But if you are making one of the larger sizes, then I found that doing this on the floor or maybe even on a bed is the best place to do that. Then you are going to organize your rows and label them. And you'll want to be specific as to if it's a window row or a background row. So I will pick up all of my rows first and I basically start with row one and I stack them one on top of the other, making sure that I keep them in order and also making sure that I stack them in the same way from row to row. So I'll do all of my row one pieces, put them in a stack, and then I'll do all of my window row two pieces and so on. So the piece that is on top of my stack was on the far right edge of my quilt and the piece that's on the bottom of my stack was on the far left edge of my quilt. Again, I'll repeat this for all window rows and all background rows. Then I'll keep them separated and labeled and ready for the next step. So now let's start sewing. Referring to step two on page five, we are now going to create our pocket units. So a pocket unit is made up of one background square and two frame pieces that are sewn together using an eighth inch seam allowance. This seam allowance is just to hold the frame pieces in place and we'll eventually sew our pockets together using a regular quarter inch seam allowance and that will cover up this basting seam. I like to work one row at a time, so I will grab my background row one and turn all of those squares into my pocket units. So I'll need some frame pieces and my row one stack. You can pin these frame pieces on your square if you wish. You'll see that the raw edges of the frame squares are on the outside perimeter of the background square. The two folds of the frame squares are touching along the diagonal. I like to chain piece whenever I can, so I sew all four sides of one pocket unit, again with that eighth inch seam allowance. Since I'm sewing around the perimeter of this pocket, I'll stop sewing with my needle in the down position, about an eighth of an inch from the edge. Then I'll pivot and keep sewing with that eighth inch seam allowance. Then I'll stitch onto the next one and then sew on. And then remember to keep these pieces in order so I just have them stacked face down off to the side as I finish them. Be sure to keep the label with the stack of pockets so that you can remember where they will appear within your quilt. So once you have turned all of your background squares and all of your background rows into pockets, again, keep those labels with them, especially for the larger quilts and especially if you are doing a specific layout for your quilt, then it's time to create your rows. Refer to the rows layouts on page five, six, and seven. You'll sew all of your pockets together using a standard quarter inch seam allowance with your pockets rotated so that the frame folds 
create a zigzag line. You'll see that that line alternates from row to row, which is what eventually allows you to create your windows later on. It's really important to make sure that you sew your pockets together in this order. So be sure you refer to the pattern so that they are turned correctly. These pockets are all in the same row, but my table isn't big enough to lay out the entire row. So I'm doing it in sections just to lay them all out and get them rotated correctly prior to sewing. Then I will stack them back up, careful to keep them facing the right direction and bring them to my sewing machine. Again, I like to chain piece whenever I can. I will sew my first two pockets together, followed by my second two pockets together and so on. Then once all of those are chain pieced, I will cut my threads. And then sew my first two pockets together with my second two pockets and so on until I have one complete row. You'll want to press the seams in opposite directions from row to row in order to create nesting seams. The pattern has little arrows beside each row to demonstrate this. So if the first row has seams that are all pressed to the right, then the next row should have seams that are all pressed to the left. This will also help to decrease bulk as these seams have a lot of fabric in them and so they're a lot thicker than your typical seam. I like to press the right side of the row first, then flip it over and press the wrong side. And I found that using steam really helps keep the layers flat during this process. Once you have one row finished, keep that label with it and do the same exact thing for all of the rows. Again, be sure you are creating this diamond shape from row to row. Once you have a few rows created, then you can start to construct your quilt in sections. So after you have created all of your rows, or if you're a little impatient like I am, you can um, just create four rows or however many rows you want to create and then we can go ahead and start sewing them together so I have my first four rows created here and basically since we created those nesting seams that's going to help us keep these vertical seams lined up so we're just going to place them right sides together this is also a good opportunity to just double check that you have all of your little pockets turned the right way because we don't want to find that out after we've sewn the rows together. So we just place them right sides together. We're going to look for those nesting seams to help us get everything lined up. You are welcome to use pins to hold these two rows together, but since there's so much fabric, this is a lot of layers to pin through. So if you have these clips, these are really handy. You can just clip right where there's a seam. So we're using those nested seams to help us line up our squares and then placing a clip on that seam. And just so that I can remember which row is which, I am going to tuck this row four label just inside this pocket, just so that I can remember later on which one is row four. So now we're going to go and sew a quarter inch seam all the way down these two rows. Backstitch at the beginning and the end of the seam and sew a quarter inch along the length of these rows. Press this seam open. Again, there are a lot of layers here, so it's helpful if you can use your fingers to press the seam open first and then follow with your hot iron.
Repeat this process until you have either your entire quilt top or the section of your quilt that you are working on. There are a few different ways to customize and adapt this pattern to fit your needs. So one of those things is sewing your quilt top together in segments. So I am making the large throw size, which is 22 rows down. Instead of sewing all 22 of my rows together, then adding all of my window units, what I'm doing is I'm splitting it up into sections. So I've sewn four of my rows together. Basically, I'm going to then attach all of my window units, move on to the next section, maybe do another five rows, attach all of those window units, and then I'm going to go through and sew my sections together. Now you might find this beneficial if you are making one of the larger sizes. If you're making one of the smaller sizes, you may or may not want to do it this way, but I have found that since this is so much fabric, this is such a heavy quilt top that it's easier to pivot and maneuver smaller sections under my machine than a really, really large section all at once. Now I will have to go back through and add my window units that connect in between my sections. So that's something to keep in mind as I'm working through my sections. So for example, this is my row 12, this is my row 13. This looks like it would be an edge piece, but it's not, it's just connecting to my previous section that I've already sewn together. So this is my window 12. I'm actually going to set aside my window 12 row until after I sew this section together with my previous section, and then I will go through and add my window 12 row. So this is my window 13 row, and I stacked my rows so that the one that is on the far right is on top and then this is over here since I'm starting on the left I'm gonna flip my row over and grab this piece so that is going to be an edge piece that goes right there and then this piece goes right here so now we're at another point where you can customize your journey with this you can sew one window at a time I call this the one at a time method, which is detailed in the Scrappy Windows pattern if you wanna take a look, or you can do a continuous line method. Again, that is also in the pattern if you want a closer look at that. I'm going to show you both methods. They both have pros and cons. I honestly like both of them kind of the same. So feel free to watch and see for yourself. Maybe try out both methods and see which one you prefer. For now, I'm going to start with the one at a time method and show you what that looks like. So basically I'm going to show you a full window and then a half window that is going to go on the edge. So let's start with this full window here. So whenever you place your window on the frame pieces that you have all sewn together, you've created these pockets that are then going to fold around the raw edge of your window piece. So first and foremost, you wanna make sure that your window piece is centered on your frame pieces. And how you do that is you look at these corners and you align them with the vertical seam. So the vertical seam that is underneath it, you want your corners to be right on top of that. And then the horizontal seam, you want your corners to be lined up right there as well. So once your corners are lined up with those seams, then you know that your piece is centered on this section right here. So then it's helpful to just put a pin right in the center just to hold it in place. And whenever you get to your sewing machine, you can take it out and adjust it if needed, but this is just to get us started. So then the premise behind this quilt construction is you are going to be folding your frame pieces around over the window piece, which is going to cover the raw edge of this window piece, ideally about a quarter of an inch. You don't want it to cover just the edge. You want there to be a decent amount of overlap. And because these frame squares were folded, along the bias, that means that this edge is extra stretchy. So the bias edge is what gives you that stretch. 
and it's what gives you the ability to curve around your window piece really without much effort at all. Just by pulling down here on the center, you can see that this center point is going to be the most stretchy just by the nature of how a woven fabric is, how the bias is. You'll notice that this center part is going to go down more. And then that is going to create a nice curve all the way up to the corners. So we are basically stitching the window piece in by folding around all of our frames. Now, one thing that I wanna point out is that you might notice that some of your frames don't 100% line up in the corners. And at first that kind of bothered me and I thought, oh no, what have I done wrong? This is going to make it look funny. It actually is a good thing that I have a little bit of an uneven sort of situation right there because that tells me which frame piece is going to go on the bottom of the fold. So whenever I fold this piece down, then I'm going to want to fold this piece. I'm gonna have an overlap in the corner and so this piece is going to go on top because this piece is naturally down a little bit further than this one. So whenever you get to the corner as you're stitching, you're going to want to assess that, which frame piece needs to be folded down on the bottom and which frame piece is going to be folded over top of that one. And if you don't have a clear answer of which frame piece is going to be folded down first, if your pieces are uh, neck and neck even with each other then sometimes it's just a matter of experimenting folding one down one way folding the other down the other way and kind of seeing which way your frame overlap is going to lay the flattest so sometimes it's trial and error but sometimes you can just look at it and tell which way you are going to have to fold your frame pieces. Now, another thing to point out is I like to stitch in a clockwise motion whenever possible. So I just feel a little bit disoriented whenever I go this way. Definitely try that out. Maybe if you're left-handed, you would prefer to go this way or vice versa. It's just worth noting that you might have one preference over another. So I'm actually going to start up here and then sew in this direction. So let's head to our sewing machine and get started. It's also helpful if you are able to roll up the section that you are not working with, just to keep it kind of all contained, helps you um, manage your fabric a little bit as you are pivoting around your needle. A couple of sewing machine settings that I wanna go over before I start sewing. If your sewing machine has the capability to stop with the needle in the down position, I have found that that is super, super helpful you are going to be doing a lot of pivoting with this quilt top. So if your machine will just go ahead and stop with the needle down, whenever you lift up your presser foot, that is going to allow you to pivot a lot easier. If your sewing machine doesn't have that capability, then you'll just want to turn the hand wheel to put the needle in the down position before you pivot. Another thing, if your sewing machine has speed control, then you want to go ahead and turn down that speed control all the way down until you get comfortable with sewing these curves. Then as you start to get a little bit of practice under your belt, you might want to go a little bit faster, but just to start out, I would turn that speed control all the way down. The presser foot that you use really is going to come down to personal preference. I always piece with this HP two foot that came with my Janome M7. It has a little bit of an even feed sort of walking foot component in the center there, which just helps grab my fabric to help evenly feed my top layers through as my feed dogs are feeding the bottom layers through. So I like to piece with this and it's perfect for this quilt. You might decide that you want to piece with a walking foot or a zigzag foot or any kind of foot. Um, I would just go ahead and try out a few and see what you think. All right, so to get started, I am going to, like I said, I'm gonna start up here in this corner and one of the things that we are going to do with this process is we are sewing literally from corner of the frame all the way to corner of the frame, all the way to corner of the frame. So you don't just want to sew where your two frames are overlapping because you'll see that there is a little bit of a fold up here that I found that I like if that fold is just stitched down. That way it's nice and secure. So if I start sewing 
all the way at the tip there and then I'm going to sew just along the edge getting as close to that edge as possible and then all the way down to this corner. Now as I mentioned I'm starting up here and looking at these two frame fabrics it appears that this frame is lower than this one which means I'm going to fold that one down first which might seem a little bit counterintuitive because I'm not starting with this frame but you have to think about each corner being sort of an interaction between the two frames. They're going to be overlapping, so it's best if I go ahead and get this fabric overlapped with this one first. All right, another thing to point out is you want to pull this frame piece down, but you don't want to pull it down so much that your background fabric under here gets sort of stretchy and warped. So you want to pull it down just enough to give you that curve but not so much that you are causing some weird tension in this background fabric here. Okay, so I'm going to start sewing right at the tip. I'm gonna put my needle down. Okay, and then my machine also has the capability to tie a knot. So I am going to tie a knot right up there at the top. I just push a button, hit my foot pedal, and it ties a knot and then I'm going to start stitching. If you do not have the ability to tie a knot, then you can forward stitch, back stitch, and then forward stitch again. You also can start and stop your seam with varied threads. And basically what that is, is when you bring your needle thread and your bobbin thread up to the top of your piece, you hold them off to the side, and then later on you will tie those two threads together insert a sewing needle into your work and essentially bury those two tails. So those are three different ways that you can start this seam. I'm gonna tie my knot and then start sewing. So you wanna make sure that your frame piece is overlapping that window piece by at least a quarter of an inch. You don't want it to just barely overlap the window piece. You really want it to be folded over that piece so that you have at least a quarter of an inch overlap. So my left hand is going up in this direction, my right hand and really kind of my right arm as I put pressure on this roll right here is pulling it down towards me and that's helping me move my work as I am going around that curve. And as I'm getting about halfway through the curve, I wanna start looking ahead to my next frame piece. This piece is just inside of this frame piece, which tells me that I'm gonna to want to fold this one down first, and then this one is going to want to go over top of that. And again, sometimes it's just a matter of figuring out which piece needs to be folded down first. You might have to try both but you want to get that folded in place before you get too close to it. All right, so now I have just stitched through this frame piece right here. So now I'm going to lift up on my presser foot. My needle is in the down position. Then I'm going to pivot my work so that I then am going to stitch along the fold going this way. And since I am stitching so close to that folded fabric there, really pivoting my quilt top like this is going to allow me to set up my presser foot and my needle in the best positions that I can get as close to that fold as possible. And then I'm gonna stitch right into that corner. All right, so lift up on my presser foot again. With my needle down, I am pivoting back around. And so now I'm going to sew once again down the edge of this fold. And speaking of needles, these corners are areas where you are going to be sewing through many layers of fabric. So you will definitely want to be sewing with a quilting needle, uh, maybe even a denim needle, just any needle that is meant to sew through multiple layers. All right, so now I'm folding this piece down. 
Press your foot down. And I'm going back around the curve. Watch my hands, how they are moving my work underneath the needle. Basically, I'm not keeping anything stagnant at any point throughout this process. I'm always kind of moving my hands to make sure that I'm getting that gentle curve around the fold. All right, I'm about halfway through my frame, so now I wanna be looking ahead to my next corner. It looks like this piece is going to want to be on the bottom, so then I'll fold the next frame piece on top. All right, now we'll pivot. This one wants to be on top. And sometimes it's hard to double check and make sure that you are overlapping this window piece by a quarter of an inch. And what I've done before, if I'm unsure, is I'll just put a straight pin down right at that intersection. So that way I can see, okay, if I stitch right on that fold, then I'm about a quarter inch away from the raw edge of the window, which is exactly what I want. So if you ever doubt yourself or if you just wanna double check that you are going to be securing that window piece with enough seam allowance, then you can just do that. All right, and since I have already stitched along this fold right here, I can stop my seam just in this corner. So I'm going to stitch right up until the fold, and then I will tie a knot and cut my threads. about our edge pieces. So it's the same exact concept, but we will want to go ahead and cut this piece before we start sewing. We are going to cut this piece in half diagonally, but we are going to add a quarter inch for our seam allowance. So whenever we line up the quarter inch line on our ruler with this bottom corner and the quarter inch line with that top corner, all right, then we cut, and then this is what that looks like. So now, whenever we go to place this piece on our quilt, we are lining up the raw edge that we just cut with the edge of our quilt top like so, and then we're lining up this corner with that horizontal seam. Right, so let's head to our sewing machine. Okay, so looking at our frame pieces, it looks like this one is going to be folded underneath this one because this one sticks out just a little bit further. So we will keep that in mind whenever we get there. All right, so I'm going to fold this down as far as I can, making sure that I don't warp my background piece. And then I'm going to start stitching sort of inside kind of where my binding is going to be. I'm still gonna tie a knot just to secure it. So 
So my right hand is holding sort of the majority of this section and I am just constantly moving that around. And since this piece is cut along the bias and it's not secure over here on the edge, I'm just going to stitch an eighth of an inch right here just to secure this piece of fabric. Sewing the corner is the exact same. You'll align the raw edges of your window with the edges of your quilt top. Sew the frame down, then stitch around the corner to secure the other part of the window. All right, so now we have sewn our window units to our quilt top using the one at a time method. Now let's take a look at how to do this using the continuous line method. With this method, you will start your seam the exact same way but you will move from window to window in a way that makes sense to you. So you can do a stair step pattern or a back and forth sort of serpentine pattern, but the idea is that the movement is a little more gentle and a little less pivoting than the one at a time method. And you're basically moving from one window frame to the next until you eventually have all of your window frames sewn down. You can see that I'm making sure that the two frames are in place and folded over each other before I sew over the corners. This just makes it look a little bit cleaner later on. Okay, so at this point, I have this little segment here. I have my quilting done going this way, and then also this way. I'm gonna take out these pins. You can see that these flaps, well, except for that one, are not quilted down. And that's because I'm going to wait until I get this section done, and then I'm gonna do continuous lines going this way. So at this point, I am going to roll up this section again. All right, so now I'm gonna keep adding squares. So this is my row eight. So I'm going to put a row eight square here, row nine. Row 10 and row 11. If I wanted to, I could add more. I could just keep adding squares all the way down the length of this section. It's totally up to you how much you want to work on at once. So then we will just keep going. By adding just a few more squares, now I can start up here and work my way down so that I can secure these seams going that way. This is kind of a choose your own adventure sort of thing. So whatever you feel like doing. You can do either the one at a time method or the continuous line method after you baste your quilt top. So then it becomes a quilt as you go style quilt. This just means that before you add any windows and sew down any frames, you baste your entire quilt top with the batting and backing. This means that when you sew your frame down, you're also quilting your quilt at the same time. I only recommend this for the pillow, maybe even the baby size. Since I'm doing a larger size, I found that taking advantage of working in sections took priority to doing this quilt as you go method. So just know that that's an option. All right, so I have my first section of six rows here up top, and then I have my second section of five rows. And now what I'm gonna do is just sew these two sections together. You can see where my middle row, I think this is window row seven, 
is missing. I'm going to add that once I sew these two together. So just like before, putting it right sides together and then using our handy dandy clips, we're going to find those nesting seams, clip, sew, and then press. Then you'll want to go in and add each window one at a time. This can be a lot of fabric to manage, but I found that rolling really helps. Also, if you can sew on a table that has room behind the sewing machine and also to the left of your sewing machine, that's helpful too. You also might want to go just a little bit slower than normal, maybe take a few more stops than normal. And if this final row is too much for your machine, you can always finish these windows by hand. Repeat this process for however many sections you have. Making the large throw, I did about four different sections. If you're making the king size, you might also want to do sections for rows and columns just to break it up a little bit more. Here's a look at how I rolled my quilt once my final section was attached. This quilt top is very heavy, so again, take breaks and take your time. Once you have your quilt top made, first of all, congratulations. The hard part is behind you. If you didn't do the quilt as you go method, you will want to now baste quilt and bind your quilt per usual. You might opt to leave out the batting if you don't want your quilt to be any more heavy than it already is. I decided to add batting to this quilt because A, I wanted to make it more heavy, make it more snuggly, and B, I also didn't want to feel those bulky seams through my backing and the batting sort of helps cushion those seams so that you don't feel them as much. So I did just a really thin loft batting. So feel free to add that or leave that out if you wish. I basted my quilt on a tabletop, which is my favorite way to baste a quilt. And I use safety pins like I normally do. I could be wrong, but I don't think spray basting would do a good job basting this quilt, especially with how heavy it is. So I definitely think that pins are the way to go with this one. I tried starting out by doing what is called a clasp stitch for my quilting. This is basically what I did for my puff quilt, which I will link to down below, but it is basically a zigzag stitch back and forth in a small area. So that is definitely a viable option for this quilt. If your machine has a clasp stitch or a bar tack function, then that definitely could be quick and easy but I ended up hand tying little X's at the corner of my frames and I absolutely love the handmade touch that this adds. So you only need to do one or the other. If you clasp stitch, you don't need to hand tie or vice versa. Another option is to hand quilt or you could potentially quilt in the background section of the quilt using your machine. But I found that hand tying was very manageable and quite enjoyable. I will be doing my next scrappy windows quilt using the exact same method. So I used pearl cotton eight weight thread 
Basically, you insert your needle through your quilt from the backing. Don't tie a knot at the end of this thread, just hold on to it so that you allow a few inches so that you can sufficiently tie a knot later on. Stitch back down to create the first part of your X, back up, and then back down again. Then tie a double knot three times. And cut your thread so that you have an inch or two of tails and there you have it. Repeat for all of the intersections and you are good to go. Finally, the binding. You will bind this quilt just like you would any other quilt. I did decide to stay stitch around the perimeter of my quilt top just to secure the edge of my quilt top to the batting and backing before I trimmed away everything to add the binding. This is of course optional, but I decided that since my hand ties weren't all the way to the edge of my quilt top, I thought it would be best just to go ahead and stitch around the perimeter just to get everything secured before I added the binding. You will bind this quilt like you would any other. The only difference is that I normally use two and a quarter inch strips. This quilt is a little thicker, so I went with two and a half inch strips. You might decide that you want to do more than that. You'll just want to make sure that you are covering your edge windows with a sufficient amount of binding. So I went back through and I checked to make sure that those frames and window edges were secure within that binding. I machine stitched my binding to the front of my quilt using a quarter inch seam allowance. Then I hand stitched my binding to the back of my quilt using pearl cotton eight weight thread for that extra handmade touch. I hope that you have enjoyed this tutorial and that it helps you make your cathedral window quilt dreams come true. I know that I was so excited to finally make this quilt and I hope that you enjoyed making it as much as I did. Again, don't forget to download the free scrappy windows quilt pattern from our website. It's a 16 page pattern. It's all a color print and beautiful illustrations. So you are definitely going to want to go and grab that. Again, I'm linking to it below. I can't wait to see your scrappy cathedral windows quilts. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up button for this video and subscribe to our channel so that you can be notified for future videos and tutorials. Otherwise, thanks again for tuning in and I will see you next time. Happy sewing.